All right. Um, yeah, so I guess, first of all, this is my first, like, uh, regional talk. Uh, <laughs> This is a subject I'm really excited about. Uh, there's, uh, it's, I guess I'm going to add a few things to go here before I get into it. Um, I, I work at a company called Next Great Place. It's a, it's a startup. The yeah, standard company is like that. Um, yeah, so I, I've uh, kind of been getting interested in data visualization. Um, it's kind of a hot topic in technology. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, like, uh, data.gov is a huge, a huge uh, repository of data for all things government. And some like labs also has a lot of tools and uh, data themselves. Uh, InfoChimps is a, um, I guess, a commercial offering. They have some uh, open source data. And uh, I, I gave kind of a precursor to this talk, like a, a sort of uh, testing, testing things out talk with my local user group. And uh, they, they really liked the slides I was doing on uh, code repositories, I'm looking at code repository information as data. I think that's pretty cool too. Um, so I, the, the means by which I was accessing this um, code from my repositories and the repositories I was interested in uh, was Grit. And uh, I think most of you remember Grit. Uh, it was, it was kind of like the first um, library that came out when they were launching GitHub uh, back, back <coughs> when that was coming out. And it was really cool because, you know, it was, it was this library in Ruby that um, would interface with your Git repositories and would provide you like ways to interact with your repository. And the reason I liked using it for data visualization is the, the data is really complete. Um, one of the things I found was just that using using some of the other uh, sources of data, the, the data would be really sparse, or it'd be um, it'd be an Excel file, or it'd be a CSV file. Uh, one of the Repos that I pulled down from uh, data.gov was the energy data. And uh, the energy data was really interesting. I thought it was, I thought it'd be cool to work with something topical and that sort of thing. But uh, what I found really quickly was that there's all these really weird formats and data wasn't where it was supposed to be and you had to use um, like six digit codes to, to figure out which, um, you know, energy source and which units were, were being used, so it got really complicated really quick. Um, Grit, Grit also provides some like really nice basic uh, built-in stats for commits and, um, and that sort of thing. And also it's really nice just because with Grit you have access to anything that's on like GitHub as far as the code repositories go, and, and I like being able to, um, when I give a talk, uh, have a subject that's uh, engaging to to the audience, <laughs> that's pretty obvious. But um, but I thought code repos would be uh, more interesting to you guys than um, you know government data or you know like a kind of weird political line if I was you know had kind of opinions about it. Um, so the first thing that uh, this slide's not very showing up very well just says persistence at the top there. But uh, the first thing I was worried about. Uh, with, with the data was, was having some sort of persistence layer. Um, uh, what, I, what I first did was um, Brick, Brick is this interface for you know, accessing all the commits and stuff, and I wanted it um, in some sort of persistence. And I, and I chose MongoDB, that I, and I thought that would be a nice way to um, access the, the data and have, have that persisted. Um, one thing I did was, as I was getting into the MongoDB stuff, is I was screwing up the data a lot, and um, you know I would, I would run over some some existing data, or um, yeah, I have duplicate data and that sort of thing. So what, uh, I thought that exporting the plain text would be really nice. Um, it's out to, uh, export out to JSON, and that would provide easy importing into MongoDB. And also, it's sort of a backup um, for the persistent data if I did mess up anything like I've been doing. 
Um, and I also wanted to do some map reduce in Mongo. That's a pretty nice way of doing that. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. So this was this was kind of the the short script I used for important data. And this first one is um, it just uh, so I used the the Ruby uh, the MRI Ruby and um, cloned down the repo and the commit count is just is just um, the the total commits. And um, I use that to, to go through each commit and import the data about each of those commits. And, and at this point, I'm just uh, writing it out to a <laughs> JSON file. And again, this is the original thing I was telling you guys about, where I wanted to have a flat file representation that I could easily import into Mongo. And so I thought this was a really nice way to do it. And uh, I'm finding that I really like uh, persisting with JSON just because it, especially with um, some of the database options available now, um, you know, like Couch and Mongo, it's really easy to, to go in and out from JSON. And then after we have that, uh, after I wrote out that file, all we have to do is run this Mongo import uh, and specify the, the database and the collection and then the file. And it, and it just takes a line by line JSON file and imports it into the uh, MongoDB. So now we have access to all these commits so that um, we can start doing things with them. Um, this was kind of the first uh, starting simple. The first, uh, this is the visualization at this point. It's just kind of uh, some data I was getting out of the repo. And uh, I, I show the slide just because it's so, so simple to do this sort of thing. And uh, especially with all the, all the uh, data heads here, it, it seems like we don't spend enough time looking at um, just kind of factual information about a repository. Um, like, did anyone, did anyone have any idea the, um, like, the amount of commits that the Ruby repo might have? Is this 22,000 an, an, an estimate that people were thinking, or more or less? Half a million. Half a million? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, I, yeah, this is just like the, some, some basic information, and then I am uh, showing how I got this out of there. And you can see, and I, was, I wanted to show these one-liners because I was just messing around in the uh, MongoDB console and getting this information out and showing how easy it is to do this sort of thing. Um, you can see the queries are really simple if you're not much of a Mongo person. Um, and, and really, Mongo isn't super significant to the application here. It's just a, the tool that I happen to use for this case. Uh, you know, uh, you could be doing this in uh, some sort of SQL solution or uh, Redis as well. The only thing that's a little bit funny if uh, you're not used to Mongo is that the uh, sorting, you can see uh, date negative one is uh, descending and then date one is uh, ascending. I think that actually kind of too mixed up in the slide here. Um, so yeah, I, I think when you're approaching this stuff, just start simple. Start doing little queries that uh, you can just get all this information out of or information that you want to uh, grab and just start simple. Uh, picking the visualization libraries, the next step that, that I went down, and there's a lot of, there's tons of JavaScript visualization libraries. Uh, Raphael's one of the uh, really popular ones, and Flock has some decent stuff. Uh, I, I really like this project, Protoviz, by uh, Matt Bostock. Um, it's a library that that uh, produces SVG style visualizations. And um, yeah, I thought that was really cool. Like, uh, it had great syntax, uh, it was really declarative in the chaining, uh, lots, of, lots of examples, and good documentation. Um, and this guy also happens to be the um, Stanford 
Germanization professor. So he's, he's definitely got some chops. Here's a little example. Uh, and they show this on the front of his website. But you can see that um, how, how appealing this style of syntax is just with uh, being able to call out these these uh, properties uh, as sort of method calls and chaining everything all the way along. It's really just <coughs> it's just one long chain of method calls to produce that. And I thought that was a really handy way, a uh, really interesting way to um, work with virtualizations, just being able to chain on stuff. Because a lot of times you add stuff to a, a, a sort of imaginary canvas. And so, uh, and, and this panel is, the, is our canvas, and we're adding bars uh, for, that, for that little array of data. And you can see, like, there's nothing, uh, you know, from, from first glance, it's pretty straightforward, even if you have not used this library before. Um, the only thing that's a little tricky, and it turns out to be a, a really nice trick, is uh, that function d, d times 80. So each, when you're in the chain, each property, um, you, you can use a closure there with uh, the function and get d, and d is the current uh, data that we're dealing with in the array. So if it's, if it's uh, so it applies um, times 80 to each of those numbers in the array. And that's to create the height. And so yeah, this is a very simple example. Um, this is a little bit more complicated example. This is a uh, Ruby code base from uh, the, the epoch down there on the left towards uh, current day. And this is actually taking um, the delta for each, for each uh, commit and adding it up. And so this is the size of the code over time. This is like how the Ruby library uh, has, or the, yeah, the MRI um, has grown over the years. And I, I have dates in there, but they're, uh, they didn't show up very well. But uh, you can see on the, yeah, I guess I won't come over there, but uh, the, the black spots kind of towards the bottom of those, of the, of the ramp is, is there's year separations. And I really liked looking at this pretty closely, but I had to fit it on a slide, so it's, it's a little bit jammed up. But the interesting thing is you can see that there's sort of some, in, some like juts up and uh, to the right, and you can see times when there have been more aggressive development versus, uh, you know, it's kind of smooth and not very active. So I'll show, how, I'll show how I got here. What's the first year, what's the first date, what's the last date? Uh, someone wasn't paying attention because of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm just giving you a hard time, yeah. So uh, first date is uh, 16th, 1998, and you can tell that there's probably been commits since February 8th, but uh, that was kind of the time that, that I captured uh, the repo. Um, so the way I did this is I, I uh, wrote a little Sinatra app to access the, the data from our um, Mongo import that, that we did there. And you can see um, it's very simple. Um, we're just including Mongo and we're, and we're setting up a route that's just uh, repo slash commits. And I thought, you know, um, at some point it'd be cool to have uh, you know, a, a little web service that you plug in your repo and, and it shows you um, this sort of information just automatically. Um, anyway, uh, the, the queries, um, there's, a, there's one little kind of quirky thing in there and uh, it's that dollar GT hash value 300 and that's just that's getting all the commits that are bigger than uh, 300 lines change. I found that um, when I, so it's kind of a, a filter to only include the bigger commits. And when that was smaller, 
my graph was really huge, but it showed similar things, so I just set that as kind of a cutoff. So it's only showing the commits if we back up. Uh, so these are only commits over 300 lines. And uh, I realized that dropping data like that isn't really cool, but uh, for the sake of, of getting it on a slide and, and, and just and, and knowing that it doesn't change a lot of things by having that filter, uh, I just went ahead with it. Um, and then, yeah, so like the next thing is just creating a hash out of, of the uh, fields that we want access to. And this is even more than we need because, uh, as, as I mentioned, it, it just uses the uh, additions and deletions uh, from, the, from the commits. And, and then, so you can see here, this is, in the, this is an actual view. Um, at the top, you can see that URL equals local host, and that's just interfacing to the uh, to that little Sinatra app we created to grab the data out. And 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 I, I'm doing this in sections that I, I didn't want to show all the code at once because it's it's a lot to, to digest. Even even at this, it's kind of a lot to get to get down. And I wanted to show you guys that. It's, it's not super difficult to even create something sort of interesting as the, as the change in line of code of the Ruby repository over time. Um, so this, uh, the, the sums is kind of where it gets interesting. The, the first part is just setting uh, height and width and stuff. The sums, um, you can see we're, we're taking the additions and the deletions and then keeping a running delta of of the code that's changed, and um, I'm just pushing that into an array, and then returning that big array. Uh, and that, and, that, and the, another thing that Proto is that's really nice is they have a small package of data tools that allow you to to scale your data. Um, one of the things I found with any sort of visualization is that uh, either your data is too small or too huge. So the scale it kind of provides, so it takes that deltas array and makes sure everything's between 0 and 200, sort of normalizing the data in that range. And this next uh, is, is the tail end of it. And all it is is just adding those. Uh, it, it's actually a bar chart, uh, but I made the bars really thin so that you could see the, the progression over time. And there's nothing uh, super interesting about this. I just wanted to show that that, that was the <coughs> totality of the um, of the code to, to, to create something like that. Um, one of the things I did like about Protoviz is that, well, it's not necessarily Protoviz, but a JavaScript solution is that um, for each visualization I wanted to do, I needed to create some sort of uh, some sort of endpoint for that data to be accessed at. And so for different sort of data, I'd have to do another route next to Notch app, or uh, you know, make, make another app or something like that. And I thought that was getting a little bit arduous. So I, I was searching around. And there's actually a, a library called RubyViz, which someone ported ProtoViz into Ruby. And it allows us to have these, to generate SVG server-side with, the, with, in my opinion, even better syntax. So you remember the first uh, ProtoViz demonstration uh, or example code I showed? It's very similar to this, but you can see in a, in a Ruby style, it's very clean and very concise, and uh, it leverages the, some of the block syntax we have available on Ruby, uh, and produces the same results. So I was really excited about this because I wanted to use I wanted to use Ruby, and I wanted to be able to interface directly with the data and produce an SVG graphic without having to write a little web service that takes in data and serves it up and that sort of thing. So you can see here that, um, at the, at, actually at the very bottom, um, is kind of the kicker for this Ruby viz. It's got a method called 2SVG. And 2SVG is 
is uh, kind of like the, the, the terminal call for uh, producing the visualization. It allows you to do uh, any sort of manipulation you want up until you call to SVG. And when you call to SVG, it outputs uh, SVG syntax, which is uh, in just markup. And uh, you can pipe that to a file and, and create nice server-side visualizations. Oh, another thing I forgot to mention about the proto visualization is that every time uh, I was rendering it, it has to do all these, uh, you know, it has to be the query, it has to do all the Mongo stuff. Well, let's with the Ruby, with the Ruby as example, you can just do it once, and then you have, you know, a flat file of your SVG that you can access anywhere. And, you know, you've already paid the, uh, you paid the rendering tax or the QSDG tax. You pay it once and you can use it, and it just opens up a browser, so that's pretty cool. Um, so if you want to get the last 20 commits, this is just another little kind of example of, of using RubyViz with, with our same uh, Ruby library data. And you can see that, um, you know, the green and red, uh, it's not so green on the screen there, but with green and red, um, it's as similar to what you see kind of console style output of, uh, of your last commits. And to do that, uh, I've got another few slices of, of code here. But we just access our same collection, and, and basically the, the first 10 lines or so is, is sort of boilerplate for, for our examples. We're just, we're just opening the connection to Mongo. And then you can see that the additions is about uh, two thirds of the way down. And it's another really, really simple query. Um, we're just saying give us the additions for each of the last 20 commits. You can see that I have limit 20 on there. And that's just for the sake of uh, screen real estate. Uh, we grab the del deletions too. And so that scale is something I mentioned earlier. When you want the data to not be uh, you know, wildly uh, huge or small, the scale kind of gets it all uniform into a manageable size. And the nice thing is you can set, you can set your exact um, zero to whatever y height you want. And uh, in this case, you know, we were doing, um, you know, up and down, um, or, you know, positive on the y and negative on the y, graphing with additions and deletions. And uh, we're using a similar scale for both. Um, I have to call that scale twice because uh, it, it builds a scale based on the, the data in that collection. So, um, I want the relations to be scaled properly for the, the difference in data in that range. Okay. And, and here's, here's sort of the, the bar style that we're doing. Uh, we did a proto this. And, and we can use that nice block syntax. So uh, I, I don't know if you guys are appreciating this as much as, as I really do, but uh, I, I love that that syntax is so clean and so tight and that you know, even, even seeing through this for the first time, very cursory, it's, it's almost obvious what's going on. And this is just, um, this is just putting it out to a file. And you can see I, I, I'm not being very sophisticated about my uh, HTML output, but uh, I just want to dump that viz to SVG and it generates markup for us. Um, this, was the, this was the last visualization I did, and this is um, the committers by the amount of code they change, and uh, the labels are, are a little bit janky there, but um, you can see Matt's is the big purple ball at the bottom, and uh, you can even see, you know, Tender Love's got a more green lip over there, and uh, Y down in the bottom. 
And these circles are like a really nice way to jam a lot of data really densely. Um, if we if we visualize this in a sort of linear fashion, it'd be really wide, or it would be hard to see on the screen. But you guys can can grasp very quickly uh, perceptually like the difference in code between uh, you know like maths is like hugged up next to y down there at the bottom. You can see kind of the difference in uh, amount of code that's submitted in the, <coughs> excuse me the uh, the difference in, in, in code base there. And so I thought this was a really fun way to, uh, to look at the, the Ruby repository. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of uh, variation in, in amount of commits and, and sizes and what people have done there. Um, so I'll just uh, walk you through the code and creating that. And for this I used a little map reduce. And, uh, and the reason I did that was so that I could, um, so we, we want to get the amount of um, commit data for each committer all in a row. So we want to see all the commits for all the data, and we want to add that up. And so I thought mapping this would be a very nice way to do this. Um, and you can see the, the map reduce for the, for the monitor driver is a little bit uh, crusty because you just have to give it a string for the, the JavaScript way of doing the map reduce with that emit this author and uh, reduce with um, you can see I'm, I'm summing up all of the, the values for each of the author. <coughs> then um, yes we create we create an empty array of all the nodes for all the commits and then pop them each into um, so, so take each of the, the empty, this big empty box of nodes and then populate data for each commit uh, by author. And then, um, so yeah, the, this, this, layout, the, this layout path is that ball style layout that we were doing there. And it just gives us um, a little bit of the... Uh, infrastructure for adding those dots. And, and the fill and stroke style are, are just built-in uh, color libraries that um, are provided with Ruby Viz. And you can see I'm just rejecting. Uh, that there was one called, uh, there's a committer called SVN, and I think it was uh, uh, just a errata. I don't think, I think it was probably from an SVN import that, that um, what is why it existed, so I just got that out of there. And then the, the last thing is adding the labels for each of the authors. And then again, our, our little, um, and this is, the, this is really for me the crux of, of, of my love for Ruby is just being able to call viz.2svg and having a static representation of the uh, visualization. And uh, so with that, uh, I kind of whirled through all that uh, visualization talk. Is there any uh, questions up front? Uh, what have you found with like cross browser issues with SCG? Um, I haven't looked into a lot of the uh, browser issues with SVG. I know there's a really good um, site that is specifically just for SVG compatibility every week. It does like a test over all the browsers to see, um, you know, what what supports it and what doesn't. Um, if I was doing this, yeah, uh, for like a job or something, I'd be going crazy about compatibility. But since this was um, just a fun thing for me, I, I, I was I was just kind of using whatever worked and Chrome uh, was supporting it, so I just went with it. Throwing stuff on GitHub at all? Yeah, I'll, I'll put everything up on GitHub, and uh, I'd love to talk to anyone. This is just kind of my first. Oh, and I actually meant uh, one last thing about this shirt I got doing a, uh, a, a visualization for the uh, uh, Mozilla Foundation. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't win the prize for that. I got the stupid t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm new to this visualization stuff too, and I really like the chat for anyone that's interested. So uh, thank you guys.